Welcome to Are You Ready to Garden? I'm your host, Angela Monahan. I am the Master Gardener Coordinator here in Middlesex County. And tonight we're going to be hearing a conversation about growing exotic leafy greens. And this talk um, is presented by Rutgers Cooperative Extension of Middlesex County. If you have missed any of our past webinars, I'd like to remind you that we do have um, we do have a, a YouTube channel that you could view. It's uh, tinyurl.com backslash rcevids. So that's a really great resource if there's any other presentations that you missed. Tonight's program on exotic leafy greens uh, will be presented by David Specka. Uh, David is the Assistant Director of the Rutgers Eco Complex Clean Energy Innovation Center. It's the state's clean technology and environmental research, outreach, and business incubation center, which is located in Burlington County. Dave and his family operate a 125-acre pick-your-own farm in Burlington County. Uh, they grow many crops that are enjoyed by different immigrant groups that have settled in the area, including people from the Mediterranean region who also have diets rich in healthy fruits and vegetables. Uh, Dave has earned his BS in horticulture and MS in plant science from Rutgers University. So Dave, yeah. if you're ready, you can take it away. All right, terrific. Well, well, thanks for the introduction, Angela. As Angela had mentioned, I do work for Rutgers University at a place called the Rutgers Eco Complex, uh, which is a, a clean energy innovation, innovation center. And uh, when I'm not working at Rutgers University, or I'm not sleeping, I'm working at the farm. So uh, three things. Uh, but anyway, um, I, I work there part time on the farm. My uh, wife and youngest son, Stephen, are there full time. And my oldest son is, is helping us out on a part time basis as well. Uh, there's lots to do. So it, it certainly keeps all of us really busy. Um, and, uh, and I want to thank all of you for joining me tonight for this presentation. I hope that you can take away some valuable information uh, of things that you could do potentially at your own uh, garden or in your own garden that's similar to what we do at the farm. So here's the family. We are located in a, a, a town called uh, Jacksonville, which is uh, Burlington County, uh, Springfield Township, uh, just a couple miles north of Mount Holly. Uh, to uh, give you an idea roughly where we are. If you're traveling down 206 and you go past the Columbus Farmers Market, you're about two miles away from, from where our farm is. Our story is, is uh, one that, that goes back uh, actually uh, into the early 1900s when my grandfather came from Italy uh, to, uh, to work in gardens in, in a Philadelphia estate. Um, and he brought his wife from Italy with him my father uh, was was born uh, back in 28, and together uh, they farmed uh, our, not the farm we're at now, but the one across the street, uh, and did wholesale vegetable production. Um, and that was pretty much right up through the 1990s. Uh, but we started to notice that the market changed for wholesale vegetables. There's a lot of competition as transportation and refrigeration got better. Uh, they were able to grow and ship things from much further away and still make it into the, the Northeast, uh, Philadelphia and New York City markets uh, with some good product. And so that kind of left the local growers just filling in the holes what they couldn't buy by the tractor trailer load from far away. So our farm started to transition uh, primarily to a direct market farm. Pick your own primarily. Uh, we also have a farm market on 206. Um, and, and now uh, we almost do no wholesaling at all, except uh, to other farm markets. And uh, a lot of our product is sold right on the farm or at the farm market. So let's, let's get started. Um, what I'd like to do is just to quickly go through uh, some of the vegetables that are uh, very popular with populations from the Mediterranean countries. Uh, we, we get uh, primarily uh, immigrants from these countries that, that come in. They're, they're usually first and second generation looking for crops that they would grow back home. Uh, there are a lot of pick your own farms in some of these countries. And then fortunately, uh, we also have families that have been coming for, for generations now. Um, so 
When I say Mediterranean countries, we're, we're primarily uh, getting customers from places like Italy, uh, Greece, Turkey, uh, Jordan, Egypt, um, and uh, Albania, Eastern European countries. We, we, uh, we have quite a wide customer base. Uh, a lot of them do use the same vegetables and they have a diet that's very uh, rich in vegetables and fruits. And uh, they like to, to eat large quantities or, or, or buy large quantities to eat and, and, and put up, uh, but to also uh, enjoy through the year uh, when it's not being you know grown at that point in time. So we'll do a quick show and tell, maybe take a quick break for questions and answers, and then get into some cultural methods that you might find helpful for, for uh, some of the crops that, that you can grow. Um, I might also add that, that our climate in, in parts of the year are very similar to what it is in the Mediterranean. Um, I'm not gonna cover very much about the warm season crops, things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, which are also a big part of their diet, um, or, or a lot of the squashes that would grow through the summer. Um, I'm gonna focus mainly on, on the leafy greens and also touch on a few others that, that might be a little bit different. Um, so I wanted to start off the, the uh, presentation with one of our mainstays, and that would be spinach. Um, we, uh, we don't grow spinach in the summer, but we do have it pretty much um, from uh, late March through May. And, and again, in the fall, we, we start picking it in September, and it goes right on up till Christmas. A very cold, hardy crop. And actually, the colder it is, the sweeter the spinach gets. So uh, that's a, an interesting crop. Uh, we actually plant um, spinach in October for harvesting in late March, early April. Uh, it overwinters here in, in New Jersey quite well. And this picture is actually an overwinter crop from last year. We also do a lot of uh, Swiss chard and, and beets. So we do red and golden beets as well as uh, white Swiss chard and multicolor Swiss chard. These, these crops are all in the same family with spinach. Uh, so their cultural methods are very similar um, and they're all very diverse and delicious crops. We also do a lot of lettuces. Uh, some of the hardier ones that can take some cold weather are endive and escarole, you see on the left. Escarole has a smoother leaf, uh, but very popular in soup because uh, it's tougher. It, it's not one that lends itself to a salad very well. Uh, but we also have the more tender varieties, the ones that will get hurt by a hard freeze or frost. And that includes things like red lettuce, green loose leaf lettuce, bib lettuce, romaine and iceberg lettuces. Uh, all can be grown in, in our region very nicely. We also grow uh, crops that I would consider as salad greens. So uh, that would include dandelion uh, or also called chicory. Um, in our case, we, we buy varieties that we can sow directly, uh, but you can also harvest it from your yard or along the right of ways. Um, as long as it's not an area that's been treated with some kind of a pesticide, uh, you should be good to go. So it's probably safer in your own backyard if you know that it's clean. In addition to that, though, we also have some plants that, that we consider to be weeds. They're actually uh, very delicious eating um, and, and can be grown uh, or harvested if they come up voluntarily in your garden. And that includes purslane, uh, which is a fleshy, thick stem, uh, kind of pink to red color. You see in the upper right-hand corner, as well as lamb's quarter, which is uh, the one in the center, lower, lower part of the screen. Uh, that uh, needs to be eaten when it's young. It gets kind of woody if it's older, uh, but it can be eaten in a salad or even cooked like spinach would be, and is, is very good. Um, this time of year, uh, we're picking, in addition to spinach, our, our different types of rob. Now, we spell it R-A-A-B. I've seen it used uh, or spelled as R-A-B-E, or even rapini is another term for it. Um, these are all from the coal crop or brassica family. Uh, they're biennials, so after they go through a winter season, uh, they flower the next year. And it's that flower and the flower stem that, that serve primarily as the part that, that's being eaten. Um, 
These pictures are a close-up view of some of the different types. Um, we've got one that we call sweet rob. Uh, that, that's a, a very mild type of rob. That's the one that's on the left. The one in the center is a, a, a bitter rob. And then the one on the far right is, is a collard rob. You also have kale and cabbage rob. Uh, they all flower close to the same time, which in our areas is um, through late March and, and through April. We're, we're still picking the kale rob and the sweet rob varieties. Um, they are planted in the fall, um, uh, usually by late August, early September, mid-September at the latest. Uh, make a nice cover crop, actually. They cover the ground very nice. They stay as a rosette. And then once they go through the cold winter months and things start to warm up, then they, they shoot up the sprout. You pick the flower head as well as about six to eight inches of the stem and leaves. And it's the leaves and stems that are primarily that are primarily what's eaten and the flower adds a, an additional flavor to it um, but they're really delicious and i think the the bitterness of, of the rob family um actually is something that, that we kind of crave in the spring after we've been through a long winter without any fresh greens uh, same can be said for dandelion uh, but uh, but it's a, a a very delicious crop and and one that's fairly easy to grow in, in our area because uh, very few insect pests through the winter and spring, and uh, it also makes a really good ground cover through the winter, or a, like a cover crop. If you don't pick the rob heads, uh, eventually they do flower, and uh, we actually let a lot of our fields flower because we have a beekeeper that, that keeps his hives at the farm, and we let them feed off of the yellow flowers. Now, in order to stop these uh, flowers from producing seed that will reseed themselves, uh, we need to mow it down after the pods have been set, but before the seed matures. Uh, so we keep a close eye on it, and usually by then the flowers have, have all dropped off, and it's just the, the seed pods. Uh, but for a while, it really provides a lot of good um, pollen and nectar for the bees. Then you have uh, the small greens. These, these are all, again, in the brassica or cold crop family. Uh, some of our popular ones are mustard greens, Rape greens, um, you may have heard of rape seed that, that's grown for the seed, for a high quality oil. Well, the greens that that, uh, that crop produces are also very good tasting um, and uh, are very mild as far as a coal crop goes. Uh, in the spring, they also uh, lead to the sweet um, uh, bitter, uh, broccoli rob that we have. And turnip tops or, or turnip bottoms uh, also, we'll, we'll do the same thing in the spring, and we grow quite a few of those. Uh, collard greens are very popular with some of the Mediterranean cultures. Uh, the, the leaves are harvested, and they are uh, rolled with rice and meat to make a, a, a dish that's very good. Uh, much like you'd make stuffed cabbage, uh, this is only smaller. Uh, the Greeks will use uh, grape leaves to do the same thing, but other cultures use collard green leaves. The nice thing about collards and kale as well is that they grow um, pretty much from April, where we are now, uh, out in the field and can be grown right through the summer and into the fall months. They're, they're a real versatile uh, greens crop. And so is kale. Now, kale is very popular now. Uh, it's kind of funny because my, my wife and I joked that 20 years ago we were ready to give up on kale uh, because there wasn't many people that were picking it anymore. It was just used as a garnish. Now a lot of folks have realized it's, it's health benefits and uh, use it to, to make a, a lot of uh, drinks that they, they uh, have for, for, uh, for healthy drinks. And uh, there's a lot of different types of kale. Uh, we tend to grow two types there, the, the, the Tuscan kale, the smooth leaf, and then also the curly kale are uh, both grown, you know, season long. We also do a lot of cabbages. Uh, we have green, red, savoy, as well as Chinese cabbage. Uh, we also grow uh, what we call a Dutch cabbage. It's kind of pointy, very quick maturing. Um, and uh, these, are, these are planted primarily as transplants anywhere from uh, uh, June through early August and, and produce a, a nice crop
primarily in the fall months is when you get your better quality cabbage. That happens to also be a time when a lot of people are looking to put cabbage up, either a sauerkraut or they have a pickling method where they basically put the whole head in, in a brine solution. They stuff, they take the core of the, the cabbage out and stuff it with salt and, uh, and preserve it so they can eat it all winter long. Also, some other uh, coal crops or brassicas that are very popular are Brussels sprouts, broccoli, and kohlrabi. Um, the whole brassica family is pretty amazing in its diversity. It's kind of like the, the, the canine of the, uh, the vegetable world where the, the, the different varieties of, of all the, the coal crops that are there, the brassicas, are amazing in, in, in the amount of diversity, and yet they can all be crossbred with each other. It's pretty amazing how, how, uh, how versatile they, they have become and, and good eating as well. And you've got the cauliflowers. Uh, cauliflowers are primarily a fall crop, although we can get uh, some of our quick maturing cauliflowers to, to grow in the spring. Uh, for a June harvest, we plant them in, in April. Uh, but basically the fall crop, Includes the, the, the typical well-known white um, white cauliflower, purple, yellow. And the one on the right is called Romanesca. Um, some of you may be familiar with it. It's a very hardy cauliflower. It does not need to be wrapped or where you tie the leaves up above it. It's got a nice bright green color. And you can see how the whorls develop on that, on that head. Um, the kids love this when you steam it because when you take those little spirals off, they look like little Christmas trees and they can eat them like they were a monster eating large Christmas trees or, or evergreens. And it's, it's kind of a fun vegetable for them to enjoy, but it's also very delicious. So I uh, definitely would recommend putting some of them in your garden if you uh, can get the seed. Brassica root crops are also very popular here include rutabaga, upper left-hand corner, uh, the purple top turnips, lower lower left, daikon radish, uh, very popular uh, uh, from a number of cultures that like that, as well as the leaf tops. And then, of course, all the different types of radishes that can be grown, very quick growing. Uh, all these are primarily either an early spring or a fall crop in our region. We also have a number of other root crops. Uh, leeks are very popular, uh, very easy to grow in the garden. Um, they don't get a lot of pests um, and they can be planted uh, starting at this time of year. Uh, so you could harvest them, they're, they're long season crops. So they take about 120 days um, or, or slightly less in the, in the summer. But uh, the ones that are planted now would be ready for harvest in August and, and September. Uh, we plant leeks all the way up till uh, the beginning of June. Um, and at that point, then they're going to be harvested more into October, November timeframe. Uh, they will also overwinter the open pollinated varieties of leeks. Uh, we're, we're digging some of them now and they survive our winters. Uh, but you got to get them early because they will bolt on you. And at that point in time, they get a very stiff stem in the center and that doesn't make them very edible at all. Uh, carrots, uh, they're very popular with pick your owns. Uh, the children especially are always surprised at how long of a root can come out of the ground that has just a small top on it. Makes it challenging to dig when they're down about you know 18 inches long, but uh, it's really a fun crop for, for children to harvest. Um, they, they can also be planted early um, and, and harvested in, in uh, June and July. If you have the the, uh, the, the baby fresh carrots, uh, some carrots can be grown long season. So they're planted more in May and harvested in September that they, they get really big for soup. Uh, we don't grow those varieties. We tend to grow the smaller, uh, sweeter varieties that we plant primarily in, in midsummer to, to early fall and harvest in, in 60 days. Uh, but very, very popular at the farm. Also, uh, we, we grow a number of herbs that you could also grow in your garden, uh, including things like parsley, uh, basil, um, uh, cilantro, 
uh, the list goes on. There, uh, rosemary and thyme. There's there's a lot of herbs that we fortunately can grow here. Some of them will overwinter. Some of the rosemaries. Uh, the the picture on the left is fennel. Uh, that's harvested um, usually starting in the fall, but it can also be grown if you start your transplants early in the spring. You could harvest them uh, by late May. And it's that white bulb at the base of the plant. Uh, that's harvested and, and chopped up very finely for salads, very, very good tasting. Uh, or it can also be cooked into a variety of different sautés as well as soup. We also do a lot of legumes at the farm that would do just fine on your in your garden as well. Um, these are varieties that are all very popular in the Mediterranean, uh, starting from the left, which is a, a flat bean uh, or Italian broad bean, they're also called. Um, and you've also got the, the French horticultural or, or, or uh, cranberry bean. It's also called Regina beans. It has a lot of names, uh, but it has the, the red pod and, and the white seed with red flecks inside, primarily used in Italy for pasta fazool. Uh, we've got a lot of different types of peas, including snow peas, sugar snaps, and regular English garden peas. And the bean on the far, far right side of the slide is uh, fava beans. Now, fava beans are a cold season crop. You've got to get them planted in the spring as early as you can. We actually plant ours on black plastic mulch uh, that was laid the year before. It keeps the soil warmer. The crop comes up more uniformly and gets a, an earlier start. Uh, they will flower in May and harvest in June, usually mid, uh, uh, mid to late June is, is when fava beans are harvested. They don't take the heat well, um, but they are a, a, a long time cultivated crop. They were actually one of the first crops that were recorded for cultivation methods back in the Egyptian days when, when they were writing on stone. Uh, the fava bean culture was recorded there. So they've been around for a long time. A very good bean if, if uh, you have the right recipes to, to cook them in. Um, but they do have a strong flavor. I think it's a little bit of an acquired taste. Uh, but there's a lot of other uh, legumes that, that in the garden setting uh, would make really good crops. Because they're legumes, they, they don't need as much nitrogen fertilizer. They make some of their own nitrate or nitrogen for, for crop growth um, and, uh, and also very healthy to eat. Good, good source of uh, protein and fiber. Some of the more uncommon crops that we grow that are very popular, on the left is a jute leaf. Now jute, when it's growing, looks to me a lot like a tea bush, the way it grows kind of as a shrub, a small shrub. It is an annual here, it does not survive through the winter, um, but the leaves are picked, as you see in the center picture. Um, very popular uh, from the Mediterranean community uh, in soups. Um, some people will also cook them with hot pepper and put them in the middle of a, a bowl of rice and eat them that way. Um, but they have a tendency to thicken soup uh, the way that they, they uh, when they cook, they, they thicken the soup. And the same is true for the crop on the right, which is okra. Many of you probably are familiar with okra, um, used in, in uh, gumbo soup, uh, can also be cooked at, or fried. Um, and this is a very popular crop amongst the, the Mediterranean community. Uh, we tend to grow mainly the green one, uh, but there's other varieties that are red and uh, even some striped and, and different odd shaped uh, okras are available as well. Um, they have a very pretty flower. They, they, they grow to be very, very tall plants. It's not uncommon uh, through the year to, to get them to be six or eight feet tall. Um, the fruit, when it starts to develop, the, the pods grow very quick. So you got to uh, get into the crop every uh, twice a week, probably every three to four days to harvest the tender okra before it starts to get stiff. Um, and it is a, a tricky crop to harvest because the, the plants tend to have these tiny little hairs on them that get very itchy. Uh, so when you harvest, harvest with long sleeves on um, but uh, but it's worth the effort to, to get in there and, 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 and harvest the okra. I think you'll you'll enjoy that.
We also grow a lot of vine crops. And, and again, it's kind of diverging from, from our topic tonight, uh, but it does go well with the Mediterranean foods that are, that are uh, uh, eaten uh, by people in our region. Um, and uh, they, they will tend to like the younger, tender cucumbers uh, or pickles um, that grow very fast and are very tender, don't have to be uh, like peeled. Uh, they just dice them up like they are or pickle them as well, as well as the squashes, both uh, very young, immature, as well as mature squash are very popular. We also grow a lot of uh, winter squash that I don't have any pictures of today, uh, but they are uh, squash that are, are um, harvested um, hard. Um, they keep well um, as long as you keep them cool but not frozen, and they uh, will... Um, They'll hold up well, and they, they taste really good. Some of them are very sweet um, that are that are uh, favorites amongst the, the Mediterranean country uh, folks that, that come to the farm. So that's a quick rundown or an intro to um, some of the crops that, that, that I think would do very well in your garden, that you'll probably find a lot of good recipes online from Mediterranean countries on, on how to prepare them. If, uh, if you don't already have a favorite recipe for those crops already. Uh, so I'm going to stop here just briefly and, and see if there aren't any questions before we get into the video. All right, Dave. So we have a, a couple questions. As far as the romaine lettuces, um, do, you, do you find that there are a lot of different varieties to grow? Maybe some that look different from the grocery store varieties? So, yeah. So for romaine lettuce, um, it's tricky to get it to form a big head like we're used to seeing in the grocery store. Here in, in New Jersey, it doesn't head up the same. The, 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 the heads tend to stay looser. Um, and in our experience, they tend to bolt quicker too. By bolting, I mean that they send up a seed stalk and, and get bitter tasting so that they're not very good. So because of that, there is a, a number of smaller headed, um, looser leafed romaine lettuces. They taste just as good, if not better, than the typical uh, romaine lettuce does. Um, Johnny Seeds, for instance, uh, out of Maine, uh, in their catalog lists quite a few different types of romaine lettuce. Uh, all of them are, are worth looking into. We, we tend not to grow too many different types of romaine lettuce. Uh, just a couple of the green varieties are what we stick with. And then um, do you have any advice on growing string beans? Well, there are a number of, of the bush type string beans that we grow. Um, I didn't put them in the list uh, for a picture, but they are very popular, both both the green as well as the wax beans or the yellow ones. We, uh, we plant them in 36 inch rows. Uh, down the row, we space them about two to three inches apart. I mean, they don't take frost very well. They don't take cold weather. So you probably want to wait until early May before you plant them in the ground. Um, but uh, other than that, they're one of our more um, or, or less less uh, care intensive crops. They, they, they tend not to have a lot of issues. So uh, definitely a good crop to try and grow. Um, so I don't know if there's an issue that, that they've come up with on, on growing their, their green beans, but, but uh, for us, it's, it's one of the easier ones. Well, why don't we go ahead then and, and uh, watch this little quick video then with Steven. Okay, well, with, with all green seeds, they're relatively small seeded as compared to corn or a bean seed. Uh, so really what we're talking is seeds that, that are, you know, really small. You see, they're, they're, they're almost like as fine as like, like dust, really. So when you prepare your seed bed, it has to be really uh, trash free, no residue at all, and really homogeneous soil texture so that the seeds, the seeds have a chance. Um, really all, all brassica, which is collards, broccoli, cabbage, uh, all their seeds are real similar looking. So when you go to transplant them or plant them, it's nice because you'll use the same planter and you really only have to determine 
what you want your density to be or how far apart you want each one spaced, you don't really think of it in terms of density. You think more of like uh, how many inches between each plant do you want. Collard greens, you'd have more because they're a bigger plant, six inches maybe. Uh, beets, two or three inches. Swiss chard, two inches. And uh, those are all, all just figures that you work out over time. Okay, so I thought I'd just spend uh, another 10 minutes or so with some cultural tips on growing greens. Um, and uh, for most brassica and leafy greens, they have very small seed, as, as Stephen mentioned in, in the, uh, the video. Um, and for plants that, that are spaced six inches or further apart, I would recommend using transplants. It's just because um, you, you tend to, to stretch your, your, your seed a little bit further that way. Um, your, your spacing is, is better controlled as well. And it's hard to plant a seed bed where the seeds dropped every six inches and, and still get a good stand. Um, so uh, for things that are six inches or more apart down the row, I would definitely recommend that you um, go ahead and, and, and uh, use transplants. Now for the smaller things, the smaller seedlings that are less than six inches apart, um, those you would want to direct seed. Um, and that would include a lot of your small leafy greens, spinach, beets, and Swiss chard, um, you, you go ahead and direct seed those. Um, and they need to be planted anywhere from a quarter to a half inch deep. So they're not really going very far below the surface, but it's important that you have good seed to soil contact. Um, and, and a good way to do that is to start out with a fine seed bed, uh, but to also after you seed, press the soil lightly. So, so you push down on the soil we actually use it at the farm. One of our main planters is an old planet junior cedar uh, that my grandfather actually used. So it's well over 50 years old now, uh, but it does the trick when it comes to these tiny seeds uh, where you don't have to have exact seed placement, but, but uh, you know, uh, one to two inch placement is, is easy to do. Um, and, uh, and it has a press wheel afterwards that, that presses a, a nice, um, lightly mild seed bed. When you are preparing your, your uh, seed bed, um, it's, it's good to make sure that you keep the, the, the bed firm. So um, when you step on it, there's a gauge to how firm it is. You want your, your shoe to sink into the soil about an inch. Any more than that, and it's too light, any less than that, it's probably too firm your roots of the crop are gonna have a hard time growing through the soil if it's too firm. Uh, so it takes a little bit of practice, but uh, usually with a rototiller or a spade turned over with some raking afterwards, you can prepare yourself a nice, nice seed bed. Um, if you have any kind of uh, leaf mulch or, or fine mulch, uh, and you can sprinkle that over the seeds after you've planted, that does aid with germination because it keeps the moisture in the soil more uniform. Um, but if it's hot out, definitely keep your irrigation handy uh, to, uh, to sprinkle the top of the soil. Uh, one of the worst things that can happen is for your seeds to start to germinate and then get dry, uh, because that's, that's certainly one way it'll kill them. Um, so once they start to germinate, you want to make sure it stays moist. Um, so having the, the, the mulch there helps. Uh, having the sprinkler irrigation system on there uh, also helps get them up and, and get a good stand. Um, if your soil is heavy, meaning that it has a lot of clay in it, or if it tends to stay wet, if it's in a low part of your, your yard, when it rains, a lot of the water runs towards it, definitely put your plants up on raised beds. Um, that, that elevation helps the roots to stay uh, better aerated, yet moist. Uh, so consider that in, in choosing your, your place to seed. Um, and if you plant your seeds in rows, it, it helps with weed control as well as for harvest. So I would recommend planting in rows uh, for some of the closer space plants, anywhere from 10 to 12 inches between the row and down the row, one to two inches. Um, and they do sell uh, hand cultivators that you can push down the row, uh, either with, with knives or with cultivator teeth to help stir the soil up in between and that goes a long way to control weeds. Um, and the summertime is, is really the most difficult season to get a good stand for direct seeding crops. And, uh, and so you, you 
probably want to try doing your seeding in the spring or early fall. Uh, that, that August into September window that I talked about is, is a good time for seeding the overwintering crops as well as some late fall crops that grow quickly. Um, and it's pretty easy relative to the summer months to get, get your things up. Um, if you're looking to plant in June, July, and early August, um, definitely have your mulch handy, your, your irrigation system as well for, for planting. Now, one thing I didn't mention here is that the use of uh, plastic mulch is also very good for your transplants. I would recommend that, that in, the, in the spring up till about uh, mid-June, that you plant into a black plastic to keep the soil warmer. You can plant after that, tomatoes we plant up to the 4th of July, and peppers even later, but we put them on white plastic to keep the soil uh, cooler. It also tends to burn the, the young tender seedlings less and you get a better crop production from that. For fertilization and irrigation, uh, leafy greens tend to use a lot of water. Um, if you have a combination of drip irrigation uh, to, to moisten the soil, as well as overhead irrigation for May through October, that's the season when you're going to need to add additional water. Um, overhead irrigation is, is good when the crop is young uh, because it can be used uh, to cool the crop as well. Uh, that's a practice that's used in California quite widely, actually. They have such dry air, they sprinkle water on the crop, and evaporative cooling helps to keep the crop cooler. doesn't work so well here in, in, in a more humid region, but, but it does help seedlings and young plants to, to uh, grow better and, and deal with some of the summer heat, especially since it seems anymore that we get a lot of prolonged hot spells in the summer. Leafy greens are also very heavy feeders. They use a lot of nutrients by nature. They grow fast. They put on a lot of biomass. So make sure that you fertilize accordingly, whether that's through organic sources, which also provide a good root zone environment, or whether you're using chemical-based fertilizers. Uh, one of the nice things about the chemical-based fertilizers is they do provide a quicker response, typically, than the organic fertilizers do. Um, and are very useful after a, a prolonged period of rain uh, where maybe some of those nutrients are being leached out of the soil. Also, when you're fertilizing, avoid putting all the fertilizer on at the beginning of the crop, the crop unless it's a really fast crop like radishes or some of the, the, the baby greens for salads that only take three to four weeks. Uh, but, but several side dresses for any crop that's there uh, for two months or more is a much better way to manage the fertilizer and to keep your crop healthy. When it comes to insect and disease control, uh, everyone loves leafy, leafy greens, including insects and animals, fungi, and bacteria. Part of your challenge is going to be scouting and keeping a close look on your crop, on your plants in the garden, to make sure that if there is something starting to establish in the crop that you don't want, you either can pick it off by hand or you can remove the leaves uh, before you get into some of your uh, 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 chemical or, or organic controls. Uh, crop rotation is an important way to combat a lot of problems uh, because whether it's the, the weeds that, that like certain crops or diseases, um, by rotating to a different part of your garden, uh, that will really help reduce some of that disease and insect pressure. Uh, floating row covers, which are the, the woven fabric uh, that lets air and, and, and rain and, and light through are very good at keeping insects and animals out. And uh, aeration around the plants also really helps uh, prevent and, and reduce some of the disease pressure. That goes back again to planting in rows uh, to allow air to get down between the crop, between the rows, and, uh, and dry the leaves out early in the morning. Also, to, uh, to keep the soil on the surface a little drier if there's fruit or, or leaves resting on it. Fortunately, there are a number of good, safe organic sprays available for home gardens. And I've seen this really uh, take off over the last uh, 20 years or so. The gardeners now have uh, many more options of, of safe to use products uh, for their home garden to control some of the insects and disease problems. Um, and beneficial insects can also help. Uh, certainly everyone's familiar with ladybugs and, 
some of the beneficial wasps that they're out there to control some of the smaller insects. Uh, but also if it doesn't uh, skeeve you out to do it, removing the insects by hand is also a very effective way to do it. And again, it's much more effective if you catch it early and you only have to pull one or two worms off rather than uh, wait until things have gotten out of hand and, and all you have left in there is Swiss cheese for leaves. So uh, that's that's an important thing to uh, to stay on top of if, if you're going to be successful in the garden. That's just a, a few tips on, on how to take care of, of some of the crops. I, I want to open it up for questions. Um, but before I do that, I definitely want to give uh, credit to Wendy Beyer. Uh, she works for us at the Scale House and has worked with us for almost 30 years now. She took all the pictures that I've shared with you tonight and has done a terrific job of, of uh, communicating an image of our farm to our, our, our customers. And uh, really thankful for the pictures she's taken for us. She also manages our Facebook page, uh, which you see the address for here. And I want to thank you for, for joining me this evening. That concludes my presentation, but I'd like to just open it up for any questions that you might have. That was really great. Thank you so much. Uh, so, Dave, um, we have a question about uh, radicchio. Oops, where am I at? Yes. Um, can it be grown in this area? And, um, you know, have you grown it? So we have tried to grow it, but not very successfully. Um, I think the trick to, to growing a, a good crop in this area is to be able to start it in, in the greenhouse uh, well ahead of when you would put it in the field. Um, it's it's a, it's a longer term lettuce crop than than some of the others, um, and it always just was either going into the the warmer time of year when it didn't have a very good quality, or it was getting froze out in the fall before I could get it to mature. So so we don't grow radicchio. Okay, but it, it's possible to grow here in New Jersey. Yeah, if if you start okay. the plants in the greenhouse and and grow them in a large enough pot that you get a good sized plant going into the garden that, that, that works. Do you have any experience with using reflective mulch to deter uh, white flies on brassicas? I have tried some reflective mulch on our farm. Um, I didn't notice a big difference between that and, and, and the white or black plastic. But that doesn't mean that on a smaller scale that, that you wouldn't see that. I've heard of that being done uh, on in a number of research papers. So, so I would tend to believe that, that it could be true. I wouldn't want to use the, the, the silver plastic, though, in the early spring. Uh, the black plastic definitely offers some advantage of warming the soil up quicker mm -hmm. than silver would. On the same note, um, how about white plastic for use in the summer for some of the... Um some of the leafy greens? Well, that's a good question. It, it, it definitely would help because the, the white plastic is going to keep the soil a little cooler. Mm -hmm. um, but depending on which green you're referring to, uh, things like uh, turnips, mustard greens, uh, rape greens, or arugula would probably do just fine, as well as collards and kale. Um, but uh, I think the lettuces would still struggle with the heat, even, even with the white plastic. With your crop rotation, which crops uh, normally follow which in your in your rotation plan? So in, in our rotation, um, we start with the brassica. Um, the brassica crops uh, like sort of start off our our cycle um, and uh, and they like you know, a little bit higher pH. So we line the soil well before they go in and make sure there's plenty of boron, uh, which is a, a micronutrient that that they really use in sulfur. Um, and after one season of that, then we go to the, the, um, the, the solanaceous crops, which are tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant uh, the following year, uh, who also like the, the, the boron and, and the higher pH. Um, and then those are grown on, on plastic mulch, either white or black. So then the year after that, we go into cucurbits. So it's the, the pickles and cucumbers on the same plastic. Um, after we you know, clean the old crop off through the winter, uh, we, we use an herbicide to control the weeds that have overwintered and a pre-emergent herbicide. We, we plant the um, uh, cucumbers and, and melons back into the plastic. And that's our third year of rotation after that. 
then after that, it's, it's back to the brassica again. Uh, we also do throw some some leeks and onions in there. Uh, we mm -hmm. grow our onions on on uh, white plastic. Uh, they're they're planted already this season and uh, are coming along quite nicely. Speaking of leeks, Barbara was asking, is it too late to start leeks? No, it's not. Not at all. Now, um, by start, let me say, if you are going to seed them now, I would direct seed them. So put them in the garden directly and, and perhaps thin them out by transplanting them, you know, spread them out a little bit. Uh, but if you have transplants now, you could also put them in. Uh, they would be ready in, in, in August, uh, September. The ones that you would seed right now would be ready more in October. Do you, uh, do you have any recommendations for companion gardening to reduce uh, the need for pesticides? Or is if that's not your if that's not your specialty, that's yeah, that's no, it's not my well. specialty. I, I I don't have much experience with that. It, do you want to um do you want to maybe touch on some safe organic sprays that you would recommend for a home gardener? So some of them are are what would you call it S sterilants. So so what I'm thinking of is is hydrogen peroxide that can be used on 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 leafy greens to control some of the bacteria problems. Uh, there's also BT, which is a bacteria-based compound. Bacillus thuringiensis is what it stands for. There's a lot of different subspecies of that now uh, that also work very well for a lot of the worm uh, controls, cabbage loopers and things. And then for some of the smaller sucking insects like aphids and, and thrips, and even some of the onion maggots and so forth, there's spinazad. Uh, spinazad is a, another class of, of chemicals. It's a, an insecticide, but it's more for the sucking, chewing insects rather than the, the chomping ones like the worms would be. The BTs work good for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, um, we're going to try using spinazad for, um, for the harlequin bugs that we have mm -hmm. an issue with. Uh, as well as um, Colorado potato beetle, because that's a, that's a big issue right now. Now, Colorado potato beetles at the garden scale, you could probably pick off, you know, if, if you yeah, can Yes, them. yeah, in the home garden for sure, yeah. And then for fungus, you know, the, the leaf sanitizers like, like the hydrogen peroxide work well, uh, but there's also a number of organic ones now that I can't think of the name of offhand, but, but they, they do a good job on the funguses too for powdery mildew, downy mildew, and so forth. From Mary, could you repeat when you cut down your rob, uh, rapini, um, when you're allowing the bees to pollinate? So depending on, on the type of brassica, uh, they'll start flowering anywhere from now. Uh, so our bitter rob right now is flowering. Uh, to the ones that take a little bit longer, like kale and, and collards, they'll start flowering um, in another couple of weeks. Um, so that's basically the, the heads that you didn't harvest. So those flowers then open up. Once they open up, they no longer taste good. So anything with a yellow flower, we, we leave in the field um, uh, and pick your own leave. Um, but we let them, we allow them to continue to flower. Um, they will set seed. Uh, they have a long skinny pod, um, almost looks like a pea pod, but much skinnier and smaller. And you can see the little bumps where the seeds are. We will uh, look at that seed, and if it starts to turn darker color, initially it's a light green color. If it starts to get dark at all, that means the seed's maturing, and you want to make sure you, you cut that field down very quickly. Otherwise, you'll have a whole mess of, of volunteer crop coming up uh, in the next time that you tilt the soil. Uh, so you want to get that mowed down right away. How about uh, the right time to harvest okra? Okra? Um, you want to harvest okra, um, it, it takes a little bit of trial and error, but you want to, if you bend the okra fruit, you want it to snap. So you want it to still be tender, which usually means that, that from the time you see it flowering within a week, you, you want to harvest it. Uh, that pod comes out really quick. If they get anywhere from four or five inches or longer, they're probably going to be too stiff. If you're looking for different farms, in our area, we have a great website, it's tinyurl.com backslash midcogrown, and you can find all the farms in Middlesex County, what they offer, and you could use this little handy dandy QR code here to upload the map on your phone, 
And this is a really great resource if you want to go pick your own pumpkins, Christmas tree farms, and things like that within Middlesex County. Let's see. Also, uh, the Master Gardener program. If you're interested in joining us, uh, we're hoping to have a program starting this fall. Uh, the Master Gardeners are a volunteer training program. And so if you're interested in volunteering and reaching out to the public on horticulturally, uh, environmentally sound horticulture, then this is, would be a great program for you. So if you're interested, you can email the Master Gardeners at mastergardeners at co.middlesex.nj.us and let them know that you would like to be put on the email list for the Master Gardener program. And also, if you have any questions, um, if we don't get to all your questions this evening and you have some more questions on growing leafy greens or vegetable growing in your garden or anything like that, you could also email the Master Gardener helpline. It's that same email address, mastergardeners at co.middlesex.nj.us, and we'll get back to you with some answers. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Dave, thank you so much for your presentation. It was great.